What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Chart Book. This is the holiday end of the year edition. Happy Hanukkah, happy Thanksgiving, happy holidays. Um, winding down 2021, we made it almost 2022. It's been a few months, um, so thought we would compile a few charts. As always, send some in if you guys want to uh, see some featured feedback at the MebFaberShow.com. We obviously do the podcast a couple times a week, but we're experimenting here because it's got a little more visuals. Uh, so let's, uh, let's dive right in. Let me start sharing my screen. Here we go. Um, the idea farm, you guys can find more info there. That's the website email list. We send out a couple top research pieces per week. Where do we begin? We begin with valuations. We wind down the year. We are officially at 39. Uh, that's the second highest in history. If you look at this chart, this is a 10 year PE ratio for us stocks romping and rolling. I think we're up 20% this year. Um, the first time we crossed 39 was when? January 1999. What happened next? As you guys remember, we went up another 25% from there. We hit an all-time peak on the Schiller Cape ratio of almost 45 and then had zero stock returns for the next decade plus and two intervening 50% bear markets in between. Rough starting point. Uh, so who knows where it's going to go, but dividend yield similar. We're plumbing all time lows here, uh, which you're not getting a lot of income if you're investing in, in U.S. market cap weighted stocks. People love to, to focus really just on the Schiller Cape and, and talk about all its faults and some, uh, uh, you know, issues with construction over time. But really, it's any valuation metric should say the same thing when are extremes and you see all the red at the right side of this chart. On the left side, you see a few green ones and say, well, maybe people would conclude that, in fact, uh, stocks aren't expensive. But all three of these, if you notice, are valuation measures that include bonds. And all this is telling you is not, are stocks cheap because they're expensive? It's telling you, are stocks reasonable compared to bonds? And if bonds aren't, don't have a whole lot of yield, uh, in the scenario we have now, where both look terrible starting points, the bonds are 1.5% ish yield. That just means that the starting conditions for both are awful. As opposed to the late 90s, you could hide out in bonds because bonds yielded four, five, six percent. Uh, now they have a much lower return. And we did a blog post uh, you guys can check out that talks about uh, is starting bond yields being low, a justification for expensive stocks. And it turns out it's not. We can touch on that later. Everybody owns stocks now. Uh, the highest reading ever we have, stocks as a percentage of household assets. This is actually a few months delayed, so it's probably even higher than it is now. But this is, um, this is the most puzzling to me and confusing quiz uh, that, that I've done in the past few years. We actually did this just a couple of days ago. And this is a repeat of a quiz from 2017, similar results, but more extreme now. So do you own US stocks? Everyone says yes. Will you continue to hold them if US stock market valuation hits a 10 year CAPE ratio of 50? Remember we're at 39. So this has actually never happened before. This would be higher valuation that's ever happened in history. And three quarters of people said yes, which is crazy to me because if you think about why you own an investment, and historically speaking, um, the initial conditions have a huge impact on the future returns over the next decade. It doesn't check the common sense box. And even crazier, we asked another question, will you continue to hold them if they hit a 10 year P ratio of 100? So higher than any stock in the entire database, uh, any stock market, global stock market, Japan has the record for almost 100 uh, in their 80s boom. And remember they had no returns for three decades the only conclusion I can come to is people just don't care about valuations. These numbers were lower four years ago, by the way, uh, for the, the P ratio of 50 and 100. Expectations are going crazy too. So Natixis and you look at others, Schroeder's, uh, they all kind of say the same thing, which is over the last five years, investor expectations continue to ramp up. So they went from 9% to 11%. They're up around 17% now. At least financial advisors are chilling out lower, but there's a moved up too. They're supposed to be the sober ones. Um, my broad expectations is you're going to get 0% real returns on both US stocks, market cap weighted, and bonds over the next decade. Uh, and that's a far cry from what everyone else expects. But the funny thing is, 
you go back to 1999, this is a chart from Corey Wang, and this is referencing Bernstein. This was household expectations for 10-year returns at the end of 99, the worst initial starting conditions when people, the highest valuation ever in history, people expected 20% returns going forward. Like how insane is that? And you ended up having roughly zero and two massive bear markets in between. So all this really shows is optimism, sentiment. People get more excited the more stocks go up and more despondent the more they go down. That's the opposite of what you want to see. That's actually the exact opposite of the way you want to behave because stocks are not just a, a claim on cash flows for next year. It's infinite. The horizon, right? So you're buying the U.S. stock market when uh, the cash flows you're going to get for the next 10, 20, 30 years. So you really want stocks to be down and cheap based on price and then resulting price earnings as opposed to the opposite, which is what uh, people behave on. And the highest sentiment we've ever had was at this point. People were the most bullish in December of 99 and the most bearish in March 20, uh, 2009. But everything's going bananas. This is the number of stocks trading over 10 times sales has eclipsed the 99 peak. The broad market uh, median price sales ratio uh, is, is moonshotting too. And what's the problem with that? This is from GMO. Uh, if you invest in companies that trade over a 10 times price to sales ratio, historically your return is awful. It's like barely keeps up with bonds, whereas the stock market broadly does okay. So one of the dumbest things you can do consistently is pay these massive multiples on stocks. That's a really foolish idea. And yet people um, continually get swindled by that. Um, interestingly enough, we're seeing a lot of uh, breadth deterioration in the stock market. So sometimes all stocks are doing okay. Sometimes there's different pockets doing poorly. Right now, it seems like a lot of the big time uh, expensive, and this is a month old, it's even worse now a lot of carnage beneath the surface. Even though the S&P is near all-time highs, a lot of the expensive stuff has, has just been getting creamed. So you may feel this closer or not, depending on what your portfolio looks like. Um, but the funny thing is, so is like you look towards like, where can we hide out? We always talk about value. This is a GMO chart, a few months old. It shows a relative value of US versus uh, value versus growth. You can see the giant dislocation in 2000 the best value buying opportunity of our lifetime. But, but here we are, it's pretty close. And on some metrics, it even exceeded 99. So you have this huge opportunity to move to value stocks, which we've been talking about for a while, uh, as opposed to the market cap weights, which are, are still pretty expensive, like the S&P. This is my favorite chart, chart of the year. We've been talking about this all year. And what this shows is going all the way back to the 1920s, all these gray lines are what happens if you buy value stocks versus expensive. And over time, that's a good strategy, buying cheap, avoiding the deer. Uh, but what you can see was that this strategy value had its worst year ever in 1999. That was the high flying dot coms, eBay, CMGI, Cisco's of the world, all were doing amazing. And so value stunk it up. Uh, there was, you know, covers about uh, Warren Buffett losing his edge. But sure enough, 2000, after the bubble popped, was the best year for value ever in the entire history of the database is over 100 years, uh, almost 100 years, looks like. That was until 2020. 2020 was actually worse than 1999 for value stocks. But what we're seeing, 2021, playing out according to theme, and um, uh, Matthias hasn't updated this through November, but it's tracking pretty close to 2000. I think we'll, we'll eclipse it uh, as the best performing year for value in history. And so having this value trade on you know, a lot of people um, are making a, a, a great uh, performance this year for value strategies. But a lot of people also say, have I missed that trade? And the funny part is, if you look at some of these value reversion charts, the one we looked at here, I mean, it's barely a blip. You have a long, long way to go. And if you remember back to 99, um, and we asked people, said, do you tilt towards value? And, and this is my audience, by the way. So this is already getting hit on the hammer all day long about value every day. Um, so this is probably even overstated, but half the people out there don't use value. And my point here is that if you're not going to use value now, you probably never will. This is the biggest opportunity to use value uh, with the exception of 99. Um, but I don't think it's happened yet. Like it hasn't played out. So for example, after the bubble popped in 2000, I asked this question on Twitter. I said, how much did small cap value outperform the S&P in total? And people got the bucket right. 
So it said over 75%, but the answer was actually not 75 percentage points. It was 150 percentage points. So from 2000, 2003, you had this massive outperformance, but it lasted three years. I mean, and then it continued going on for, for um, a handful of, of years more. And then the financial crisis on to about 2020, uh, growth really outperformed. So, you, you know, it flip-flopped. But from 2000 to the financial crisis, you had a massive value outperformance. But in this particular three-year stretch, it was huge. And this is a good example. So this shows Vanguard small cap value versus the S&P versus the Qs. And so you see about a three percentage points per year outperformance for 20 years. I mean, that's a pretty monster difference in compound returns. But if you break that into 2000, the, the first decade, 2000, 2010, value beat by nine to 13 percentage points per year. That's insane. But then look what happened over the last decade. Growth came back, right? Um, and an outperformed S&P and the Qs both outperformed uh, uh, small cap value. But I think we've, we've seen the turn. It's already happened in 2020. And I think it's going to last for a few years. Um, but the challenge, of course, with any of these strategies is uh, it, it takes some time and it, and it has its uh, bumps. Apple was a good example, one of the best performing stocks ever, and yet it had a decline of three quarters in each decade, 80s, 90s, and 2000. And I just wonder how many people on these Robin Hood timeframes of minutes and days and weeks are going to be willing to sit through these long bear markets. We haven't really had one since the financial crisis, uh, so we're probably due for a big fat bear market at some point and will you be able to handle you know these declines uh, do you really have diamond hands or is it going to be glass hands and there's a link and i'm going to um, hop over to an article from uh, a couple academics one of my favorite articles uh and it's from besson binder and they did a paper that uh looked at the distribution of global stocks and we've done a lot of posts on this there's a few others that have done it jp morgan um, Black Star Funds, Long Board did some, but basically looking at how uh, firms outperformed. And so Besson Binder went back to the 50s, 27,000 stocks. And they showed that, um, you know, there's a, a very small handful created all the wealth. So out of these 25,000 companies, you know, disproportionate of the returns. Um, so less than 100 of the stocks created half the wealth, which is astonishing. Um, and so if you look at sort of some of the characteristics, one of the big things is like, you got to expect drawdowns, like that, that's a feature, not a bug. And so sitting through those is, is really hard, but also that, um, you know, the, the time it takes to compound, if you look at some of the names, I think a big surprise to a lot of people is uh, of the top 10, you know, you have this big chunk of tech, tech firms. But over the entire group, um, you, you see in the top 200, tech is actually underrepresented, which I think is a pretty interesting takeaway. Everyone just assumes tech's going to be the big power law outperformers. But historically speaking, uh, some of the best returns have come from other sectors rather than uh, just U.S. stocks. Anyway, check out this paper. Check out this article. Um, and, uh, and it's really worth your time. But the whole point being is that drawdowns are a normal feature with both stocks as well as um, uh, markets. So, uh, you know, we, we mentioned this value trade. Here's an article from our friends at O'Shaughnessy showing that value sprinkled in with shareholder yield and momentum. So you guys know we love shareholder yield. Uh, has obviously been a great place to be. I think it may have had its best, one of its best years ever. All right, so if we move around from US, you guys know I love inter international. Uh, this is sort of going back to the 50s, US versus the rest of the world. You can see times when the U.S. Uh, had a run, so the, the nifty 50 period, um, and then the 60s boom in the U.S., then a long foreign outperformance starting in the early 90s. You had the U.S. outperforming, culminating in the internet bubble, then that decade of uh, really foreign outperformance through the financial crisis, and then really one of the biggest outperformances we've ever seen in the U.S. And remember, as everyone extrapolates U.S. stock returns, uh, remember that this past decade is unique. So you, the U.S. outperformed the rest of the world in the 2010s, 20 20-teens, also in the 1990s. But before that, uh, you really only saw it in the 1910s. So um, this sort of outperformance, it happens from time to time, but I wouldn't say it's normal. If you look at global valuations as a broad summary, U.S. is one of the most expensive in the world. 
foreign developed is totally reasonable. Foreign emerging is downright cheap. The cheapest bucket is screaming cheap. Um, and if you do value tilts within these, you end up in an even, even cheaper buckets. Uh, so I think it's one of the biggest opportunities to move away from uh, U.S. market cap weight to, to value. And that's a global market cap weight too, because U.S. is 60% of the world. Here's a chart we did the other day. I said, you know, if you just look at ending years, when a country ends the year at a CAPE ratio of 40, uh, which is right around where the U.S. is, and then look at the ensuing 10 years, what this chart is showing, and it's not labeled on purpose, the gray are all the uh, various paths that these countries have taken. I think there's about 50 different examples in history where this happened. Um, and the average rate of return is zero, real returns is zero. And the red line is what happens if you just got a 6% real return per year, which is roughly the average the US has had in history. And the astonishing thing about this chart is um, not a single instance in history did a stock market when it ended the year at a CAPE ratio of 40 have even average or above average returns for the next 10 years. Not once, zero instances where it worked out well for the investor and on average is zero. And if you actually look at the first three to five years of the chart, that's where most of the carnage occurs is really the big drawdown comes in the next three years. So it could be sooner, uh, sooner than later for uh, this U.S. market and valuations. But, you know, that's the fun part about our world is it always can get crazier. Japan had the highest ever in the 80s at almost 100. So that would be a straight up double from here. Wouldn't that be weird? Oh, my goodness. So um, before it's too despondent, this is a PIMCO research affiliates chart, but we've done the same in-house. This shows what happens when you buy these countries when they're below 10. And there's a hand, and this has happened in the U.S. a handful of times. And um, it's certainly, there's a handful of countries now. We like to point out Russia as a good example. Russia, I think, is down around eight. And unbeknownst to most investors, has outperformed the U.S. stock market for the past five years. So Russia is at an 8 PE ratio, US is near 40. Similar performance, and the multiples haven't even contracted and expanded yet. Historically, buying the cheap has worked out great. This is a, a chart. Um, what else is going on in the world? Inflation, everyone's talking about. You know, um, The US is experiencing uh, pretty significant inflation, but it seems to be happening everywhere, right? There's a lot of green on this chart, which is uh, challenging for a lot of fixed income investors who have near zero yields, in some cases still negative. It's showing up in agriculture prices. You can see this UN food agriculture price index. And if you guys remember, uh, things really started to hit the fan back in uh, around the prior and post financial crisis, particularly in the Middle East and the Arab Spring and Egypt, Morocco and others when prices were up here. Uh, and I don't think this is something a lot of people are currently talking about. They're focused on the virus, but, but food prices could start to have a pretty meaningful impact in uh, destabilizing some countries and, and political systems and, and economies. And there's a humorous part at the bottom where it says, due to inflation, Jay-Z now has 112 problems instead of 99. So what do you do about it? I mean, the obvious answer, I think it's kind of common sense. Uh, this is a paper from former podcast alum, Professor Cam Harvey. Cam's the man. We got to get him back on. He wrote this paper with some friends from Man Group uh, talking about what do you do in inflation? Um, so the, the obvious answer is you can own real assets, real estate, commodities are a, a classic example, tips. Uh, stocks can be helpful, but active strategies, trend following is a huge one. So we run momentum and trend funds. A lot of those momentum and trend strategies have been heavily concentrated in, in inflationary exposed assets this year, like commodities. Uh, and, and commodities, you know, can, can be pretty granular. So you can't just say general commodities because energy and base metals have done uh, far different, and ag's probably in there too, far different than precious metals, which have really kind of gone sideways and struggled over the past year. So fun paper, check it out. Uh, what else? But the funny thing is you ask people, do you allocate anything to real assets? So I said defined as real estate commodities tips, not including your house. And no one does, which is astonishing because if you look at a lot of the best performing portfolios from the 1970s, when there was significant inflation, all the strategies had, I mean, it was, first of all, it was a really hard time to invest. Almost every strategy really struggled, but the ones that survived were the ones that had exposure to real assets. And 40% has essentially zero, another small margin. This is probably all the um, 
uh, 17% has five to 10%. So very low exposure to real assets. And the over 20%, that's probably all Australians and, and Canadian uh, followers. Uh, they're, they're very close to the commodity world. On the other side, we showed example, like just how things wax and wane. This shows uh, how much of a percentage of the energy sector. I mean, my goodness, in, in the financial crisis, it was up around 16 and it got as low as 2% of the S&P last year. And it's having an amazing year this year. But I think a peak it hit uh, in history was closer to 30. So that's pretty astonishing dis uh, difference for uh, the energy sector. Uh, this is the time of year to sit back and reflect. You know, if you look at your portfolio, I guarantee most of you don't have a written investing plan, which is a shame. And we have a couple uh, pieces of content. One is called Office Hours Summary. You are not alone. The other is called the Zero Budget Portfolio. But we talk a lot about having a, just a very basic written investing plan. Um, it's a good time year end to reflect, grab some eggnog, maybe some champagne, take a look at your portfolio and say, hey, um, should I clean house? You know, it's like going out to your garage. You have all this emotional attachment of just baggage and junk. And, and a good thing to think about is um, obviously this giant trend away from tax inefficient, expensive mutual funds to ETFs. So on the left side, this is from iShares, I'm going to show the uh, really heavy toll you have on the average mutual fund not just expense ratio, but tax costs. On the right, uh, Christine Benz and others at Morningstar start to put out some of these capital gains distributions for mutual funds. And this is a good example. It says just even the ones just tracking the S&P over the past five years, the median mutual fund is putting out percentage points of NAV of capital gains and look at the e ETF, zero. So if you're in a taxable account and you still own equity mutual funds, that's on you at this point. I mean, it's, it's well known. It's been well established for 20 years now. Uh, that's a foolish thing to do, but you're seeing it play out everywhere. Um, here's a good example of Vanguard flows, this mutual fund ETF transition. They're seeing big inflows on the ETFs, uh, big outflows on the mutual funds. Not surprising. It's happening everywhere. Um, one of my favorite takeaways, you guys try this with your family. Um, we've been doing this for years now. Uh, so apologies if you've heard it a million times already, but we found millions for listeners. Uh, plenty of people found $10,000, $80,000. I think the biggest is over $200,000. But it's this concept, if you go to unclaimed.org, a lot of people don't know it, but state governments collect unclaimed property if it goes uh, uh, missing. So for a good example, if you move utility bill, insurance, dividends, stocks, your family had a trust you don't know about, um, assets of your family members, they got dementia and forgot about whatever. It just goes to the state. E-Trade's not helping you find this. Geico is not search, searching for you, right? So it goes to the state. So you can go to this website, click on any state where you have lived and search your name. And you'll be surprised. You'll find something. And I joke at the bottom. I said, if you find over a thousand bucks, you owe me beers. 10,000, you owe me dinner. 100,000, you owe me some pappy. And don't let anyone charge you for this, by the way. This is free. I said, if you find over $100,000, I'm, I'm, I'm open some ideas. What do you want to do? Um, it's fun to do at the holidays. You can search your family members, your parents, your kids, your neighbors. If you're a financial advisor, uh, you can search your clients. Those would be clients for life. You find some of your clients, ten, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000. I guarantee you uh, they will be extremely happy and probably pays for your fees forever. It's something that um, there's nothing people love more than found money except for found money coming from the government. Uh, it's awesome. There's no catch. There's no scam. Search my Twitter feed. You'll find hundreds of people that have found uh, some pretty significant amount of assets um, and, and post it in the Twitter feed. So if you find anything, hit us up in the comments on YouTube and let us know uh, what you found and how much, because uh, it's pretty cool. It's fun. I would warn against searching for ex-girlfriends, boyfriends, people that may not want you searching for them, use your discretion. But it's funny, you can see a lot of famous people have plenty of unclaimed assets if you search for Britney Spears, um, all those uh, sorts of sports athletes. Um, there's plenty there too as well. Um, let's talk about a couple of things. So I'm gonna hop over to a new idea, this real quick summary, and then we're gonna hop over to two pieces of content uh, that are a little bit longer. But a quick summary of the, the chart book. Hey, you, we're ending the year. U.S. market cap weighted stocks, second most expensive in history they've ever been. Bonds don't look much better. So what can you do? You can move toward value strategies within the U.S. You go type these tickers into Morningstar. Uh, it'll show you the composite metrics across all the valuation, the dividends. Uh, so there's a lot of places you can hide out. International is much better. 
you can still find four or 5% yields and a lot of emerging international value strategies, which is incredible dividend yields. Consider adding real assets. Most people don't have any to hedge a potential uh, continued increase in inflation. Implement this, be mindful, expenses, costs, taxes, do it with a written investing plan and consider the sell as well as the buy rules. Go find your hidden assets. Let us know what you find and just give it time. Put it on autopilot. We have a digital advisor. Let's do it all for you. Uh, that I think is a great strategy, as well as a lot of these all-in-one funds. And then uh, hit me up on Twitter, shoot me an email. We're going to hop over to a piece of content we did. Um, so for the short attention span people, uh, you can probably cruise. But uh, for those who are willing to dig in, where is it? Let's take a look. So um, we did a really fun piece the other day that says, you know, we published a lot of research over the last 15 years. It's thousands of blog posts, what, seven books now, hundreds of podcasts, gazillion tweets. And so I said, some of it's been insightful, some of it weird, a lot of cringeworthy. And so I actually asked my team, I said, see if you guys can uh, come together and decide and curate the top 30 pieces of research over the years. And so for those who haven't been following us since uh, the early 2000s, mid 2000s, um, there's a lot you probably might've missed that may be interesting. And, um, uh, this isn't my ranking. So there may be a recency bias towards the last few years, but I'm going to scroll through this real fast. Uh, but, but you can see this is my pen tweet. So you can find a lot of discussion here, uh, in links, um, that will take you to a lot of these places and it's everything asset allocation, global value, farmland startups, whether institutions be managed by a robot. So, um, Number 30 just references the podcast, and this is a list of 10 people that our team thought were exceptional podcasts. So if you don't listen to the podcast, we've had over 10 million of y'all uh, download um, episodes, but you can see some of the world's greatest investors on this list as well. Pretty, pretty good Twitter, Twitter followers, by the way. So check out some of these, uh, particularly some of the older ones, if you haven't seen them, uh, beginning with Ed Thorpe, uh, a, a true legend in our world. 29, uh, man, this talks about the financial crisis. You guys, uh, there was a really fun idea that harkens back to a time 100 years ago with Sir John Templeton and what he did when the markets were getting uh, imploded during the Great Depression. We called it, is it time to do a Templeton, which actually worked out uh, pretty amazing over the ensuing year. Check it out, uh, see what the strategy was behind that. Um, this talks about the YouTube channel. So subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, the more subscribers we get, the more we'll post here. We haven't done a whole lot, but um, that's because uh, most people follow us everywhere. But if you guys start listening and sharing this, uh, we'll start to do more. 27, um, this is what I referenced earlier. I said investors love to justify stock returns being expensive by pointing to the off-repeated justif justification. It's okay for stocks to be expensive because bond yields are low. But did anyone ever stop and ask, is that true? And this is a really interesting post because it blows that theory out of the water. And it turns out, historically, yes, stocks do well with low bond yields. However, the initial conditions were always that stocks were cheap. And the reason they were cheap was because the economy was doing poorly, the Fed was lowering interest rates, all these initial conditions that are different than they are today. Today looks much more like a starting secular bear market characteristics than, than bull. Next up, 26, uh, we talked about crazy investor expectations, but we say, um, what will be obvious 20 years from now? And we talk about uh, how easy is it to get 20% returns? And how many of these managers do you see with these sharp ratios of 2.0 and more? Uh, it's a fun article for perspective. 25, we talk about drawdowns. So a good example, we said it's a feature, not a bug. We talked about this earlier. Uh, and in this case, we talk about bond drawdowns and said when things go on sale, people run out of the store. So you can see, I should have been clicking through all these, but you can see some fun charts that show historical bond market drawdowns and times uh, you know, where, what the future returns do both nominal and real. That's a fun post. Next up 24 investors spend countless hours. Ask yourself, how much time do you spend each week? I mean, if it's a hobby, that's one thing, but how much time do you spend each week on this investment alpha journey? Is that time well spent? Would you be better off, uh, working more hours? Would you be better off uh, looking for a new job, hanging out with your family, playing golf, whatever. So we say the best way to add yield to the portfolio it's actually spend no time on it, automate it and put it on autopilot. And we show uh, the extra returns needed to break even 
on this alpha quest of yours and uh, really probably a, a poor idea. Uh, 23, uh, sidewalk money. This is fun. So we mentioned unclaimed assets as a way to find money, but here's some other ideas. We talk about tax credits. If you're a business owner, look at the company we invested in Main Street, which on average, if you're a small business, finds your company 50, excuse me, $75,000 in credits. We've had plenty of friends that have already been through this uh, and it's pretty awesome. Uh, tell them Meb sent you. They'll, uh, they'll, um, they'll love you. Uh, we talk about bank yields, investing your safe money, reducing fees. This is a great um, shopping rebates, refunds for fees. This is a really fun post. Uh, 22. I don't spend a ton of time on politics and policy, but uh, one we, we talk a lot about, and we've gotten a lot of great responses from this post, how to narrow the wealth and income gap. We talk about four ideas that uh, politicians could implement. They won't. The first being teaching money in school and starting early. The second being the freedom dividend, which is my riff on universal basic income, which is basically getting people, instead of just giving them money, getting them invested uh, so that everyone's a stakeholder in the U.S., uh, GDP and growth of our economy. It's a cool idea. Third, universal retirement. Um, I don't know why retirement is often tied to your job. That's crazy. In Australia, it's mandated. You got to save some. Everyone loves it there because they end up retiring with a huge chunk of cash. Uh, and lastly, we talk about savings-based lottery. If you don't know what that is, go read the post. 21. Um, what are the best books? People always say, Meb, what are your favorite investing books? Good news is here's our favorites in this post called Learning to Invest. We did a poll with a full list. You can click on the survey to get the full list, but the top pick in about seven different categories, personal finance, stocks, asset allocation, investing 2.0. That's a good reading list for your holiday experience. Top 20. Um, we talk about investing plan. We wrote a four-part series during the pandemic that if you missed was, I thought, pretty insightful. One was the Get Rich Portfolio. Two was the Stay Rich Portfolio. Three was how I invest my own money. And lastly, investing in a time of Corona. Uh, and you can go back. This was written March 15th, 2020. And, and talk about the outcomes, what things look like, what the future looks like, some of the things you can do. We talk about over-rebalancing. We talk about buying a dollar for 50 cents, closed-in closed fund trading, blood in the streets. Uh, I, it's, a, it's a pretty um, fun look back to a pretty crazy time uh, not too long ago. Um, going back to this sort of year-end concept, we mentioned these earlier. Here's the two pieces about crafting an investing plan. Most don't do it, so uh, it's a good template. Uh, next up, oh, CAPE ratio, going back earlier. One of the biggest problems the CAPE ratio people complain about is they say, well, Meb, if you use CAPE ratio, you would have gotten out of stocks and missed uh, a lot of what's happened in the stock market at various periods. And I say, that's actually a good thing uh, because you could have hung out in bonds and done just fine. And also you could have hung out in cheaper international stocks and absolutely crushed what the US market did. Uh, keep an open mind, go check it out. It's a fun post. Uh, I need to update it for the end of this year, uh, but it's a pretty, pretty um, different approach. Um, and by the way, here's two charts that show what happened when you, the three-year drawdown from starting valuation uh, in this, both in US markets and foreign. And you can see that when stock markets are expensive, they have historically had big fat drawdowns in the future uh, over the next three to five years. All right. Number 18, people often avoid taxes. This is one of the only papers I've ever seen on this topic. Um, so it's a pretty big blue ocean space. If you guys have seen some, send them over. But it talks about if you implement a high yield approach, dividend yield approach in uh, taxable accounts, you underperform the S&P if you're a high tax taxable investor. So why would anyone want dividends and taxable accounts? Well, you technically you don't. And so this approach says, let's do a value approach, which is kind of what dividend is. It's a weak value approach, uh, but avoid dividend yielding stocks in taxable accounts. And it turns out that's a much better uh, concept. This is particularly important as markets uh, tax rates are going up. Top 17. Um, this is the stay rich portfolio. I think this is really interesting because uh, people talk a lot about corporates over the past year. Uh, treasury and putting your money in a bank account earns nothing is not the safest. And that's true because historically bonds, you ask people what the drawdown on bonds and, and T-bills has been, and they usually say zero to 5%, but if you include inflation, it's half. You lost 50% of your net worth at some point. So we demonstrate 
the, that the safest investing portfolio is not T-bills, but rather what happens when you put together a portfolio of global assets. And so you have to invest it. So if you put say half in buy and hold of global stocks, bonds, real estate, and the rest in T-bills, you end up with a much safer portfolio. Another way to look at it for similar risk of T-bills, you can add uh, two, 300 basis points or two, three percentage points of yield. And so you can see some of these charts It's a pretty astonishing different. I don't know a lot of people that do that other than me. Dan Egan over at Betterment does it. Um, but it's a, it's a mindset. Once you read this post, it's hard to go back to thinking about safe investing in the same way. Um, the crypto community, for whatever reason, has sort of co-opted this idea and has put Bitcoin on the balance sheet as a different um, approach. But uh, read this and take a, take a look. 16, um, the biggest asset class in the world is actually ex-US sovereign bonds, but they have a curious feature if you allocate to them. And that's just usually how much debt does the country have? So we examined a better approach, we think, um, called finding yield in 2% world. Uh, that not a lot of people care about this paper, but I thought it was fun. Top 15, fees. Fees matter a lot, people. People still love to pay a lot of fees. And I'd say one of the most brilliant things Wall Street did is it had fees be a percentage of assets that just get skimmed off the top so nobody sees it. I said, I guarantee you, if you had to go deliver to your advisor uh, and not dunking on advisors because I think they're worth their weight in gold, but just saying someone who's charges very high fees in this uh, category, Merrill Lynch was the highest at 2% all in, my goodness. I said, if you had to go deliver, instead of that getting skimmed off, you had to go deliver a suitcase full of $10,000 or $100,000 a year in fees to your advisor, no one would do it. But because they never see it, they do. So be very mindful of fees. It ends up being one of the biggest determinants of success. A similar one was called paying for a filet and getting baloney. You can read that. 14, how long can you handle underperforming? This is a topic that's interesting. There's an enormous amount of research. Vanguard's done a lot. And, uh, you know, most people say they can only handle a few years of underperformance before they sell something. See this, zero to three, three years. That's insane, people. Uh, we often say things need 10, 20 years to work out in many cases. And that's whether it's stocks versus bonds foreign versus US, value versus growth. You got to give it time uh, for a lot of these investments. And so chasing the hot market and selling the one that's recently underperformed is usually a recipe for disaster. Uh, the institutions, man, we really talk about these guys a lot. We talk about a lot of them have endlessly, needlessly complicated strategies, allocations with dozens or hundreds of funds. They're riddled with high fees. But does it have to be that way? We tackle this and should Harvard be managed by a robot? Uh, institutional investors, they're just like us. Which one has the best allocation? Cloning the top hedge fund in the world. And should a robot be managing CalPERS portfolio? And in every case, we demonstrate that a very simple allocation usually does just as well, if not better, than uh, a lot of these large institutions with a lot less in fees, a lot less in conflicts of interest and uh, problems. So uh, look, look for us to do some more there in a little while. Next up, 12. Uh, what's the foundation for how you build an investing approach? This probably goes back to a few of the things earlier talking about policy portfolios and drafting a plan. This one's called the investment pyramid. So we try to cut the carbs on the diet on a way to a more thoughtful portfolio. Uh, top 11 booms and bubbles and busts. One of our favorite old articles profiling a lot of history's most famous bubbles, learning to love investment bubbles. What if Sir Isaac Newton had been a trend follower? Uh, you know, the best thing you can do is ride a bubble up and get off, which everyone assumes they can do. Uh, but if you don't have an approach, there's no real way to go about it systematically. And a lot of times people get emotionally caught up. Uh, this demonstrates a very simple system to help hopefully profit from a bubble, but to, uh, to, to walk away before you lose all your money. All right. Top 10. Where did the thread go? Um... 10. Remember, my team chose this, not me. So we'll see what, what they pick. Number 10. What if you would invest in the top hedge funds, not pay them any fees and tax manage it? This is one of my favorite books. And that's with the house. You can download this for free at Cambria Investments or MebFavor.com. You can track a lot of the world's top hedge funds, Seth Klarman, David Tepper, uh, Warren Buffett, 
and and piggyback on their stock picks. And this actually shows uh, testing back to 2000, how that would have done. A lot of them does great. <laughs> it's a wonderful investing approach. Check it out. Let me know what you think. Uh, next step, number nine was another book we wrote, Shareholder Yield. Uh, the fun part about this one is it details a very simple investing approach. And we have real-time strategies doing it both in the US, foreign and emerging. They've all done exceptionally well. We're quite proud of the track record. Uh, including one of them is uh, one of the best performing strategies around um, in, uh, I think it's number one, it's category on one, three, five, seven years. So uh, it's fun, you know, like I had a, a friend once, and I think in kind of a derogatory way, called me the king of back tests. And a lot of research shows that you can come up with basically any back test that will demonstrate uh, any sort of historical returns you want. But the, the rubber meets the road is it does it deliver in the real world and, and after fees and, and uh, transaction costs and everything else. And so it's really uh, it's really good to see when a strategy actually has out of sample returns in the future. And I think shareholder yield has done an exceptional job uh, over the past decade. Talk about a little more about buybacks, FAQ on buybacks. We talk about um, the historical evidence on shareholder yield. Why do people still do dividend investing? And we say it's just good marketing. It's a good brand. We actually did a post um, coming up, uh, some research with our friends at Alpha Architects that looks at shareholder yield in 12 different sectors going back to the 70s. You know how many sectors shareholder yield beat buy and hold in, uh, in the 12? All 12, which is not surprising to me, but it might be to some of y'all. We'll, we'll, future article coming up. Number eight, the Get Rich Portfolio. I love this piece. Uh, this was written in 2020 talks about if you're going to take the big swings and go after uh, the big returns, how to think about it, what would you do, some of the ideas. I talk about some of the ways I think about it. That's a fun one. And then along the same line as the article we did on my startup investing journey, I've invested in over 300 startups in the past uh, eight years. It's called Journey to 100X. This is a fun one too. It gets into some of the names, some of the friends. It gets a ton of resources and links at the end. Look at all these links and companies even tell you the companies, full kimono, companies I've invested in. Number seven. Oh man, you guys know I love talking about home country bias, why everyone invests in their own country. We talk about a global approach. This global approach has been kind of stinky relative to the US for the past decade, partially. That's just because the US has romped and rolled. Uh, I think that's the next stage of this uh, market regime is, is the rotation away from expensive US into foreign and particularly emerging markets value. So global value talks about avoiding the expensive, investing in the cheap. It's not always like it is now, y'all. It's not always U.S. stocks are expensive and the rest of the world's cheap. Uh, often um, it flips and flops over the years. Uh, we talk about where you can find updated global valuation resources in this thread. So we talk about, we do it on the Idea Farm. We talk about Research Affiliates, Barclays, Schiller, on and on. Um, one of my favorite posts is called The Case for Global Investing. And this is a summary of five research pieces that are linked in here. I don't know how you read this and not finish and decide that you need to have, uh, certainly at least if you're a US-based investor, half invested abroad, if not more. Um, I don't think you can come to that conclusion. I don't think there's any way you can still put, the average US investor puts 80% in the US. I don't think you can uh, read this honestly and come, come to that conclusion by the end. Six, um, oh boy, yeah, this big one, you hear this all the time still. What happens if you dismiss the 10 best days in the market? Uh, it's almost like a, a compliance violation, ethical violation to make this claim without reading my article. Where are the best swans hide in the 10 best days myth? It's a fun article. Top five, y'all. Number five, what'd they pick? Um, oh, this is the Trinity portfolios. You know, a lot of people struggle between do I do buy and hold, a great investing strategy? Do I do trend following, another great investing strategy? They're usually pretty different. We talk about how to combine them into one, yin and yang. 2020 is a perfect example of why that's such a great strategy, not just for uh, the returns, but psychologically speaking as well. Because 2020, first quarter, man, you're like, thank God I have trend following. But then the rest of you, you're like, thank God I have buy and hold uh, because the market bounced right back. Um, this year, trend following is, is showing its stripes uh, for a different reason. That's largely because it's um, you know, investing in a lot of real assets like commodities and real estate. Fun paper. Number four, uh, this is about tail risk, man. Tail risk is an interesting topic. If you make it to the um, 
appendix of this paper, we do simulations of tail risk and strategies back to the 1980s. The appendix has a really interesting takeaway for financial advisors and, and why you're probably five times leveraged the stock market and just don't know it. Uh, so try to make it to the end. Um, it's, it's a non-consensus view, but I think it's one that's very thoughtful. Number three, uh, sorry. Yeah, number three, global asset allocation. Uh, love, the, love this book. It's free. It does a horse race of all the top allocation strategies in history, how they perform, what are the differences, what factor that most people overlook is probably the most important of anything. Check it out, nebfavor.com, free PDF. Number two, Ivy Portfolio, my first book. This has got a lot of stuff in it. Asset allocation, cloning hedge funds, tactical ideas. Uh, one of my, our favorites down in a row mean reversion systems where we used to talk about um, investing in, in industries and sectors after they've really been pounded and what happens. Uh, that's held, out, uh, held up actually pretty spectacularly post-publication. Number one, the paper that started it all, of course, uh, quantitative approach to tactical asset allocation is usually the number one. Ah, it's number two. I'm going to have to update it. Most downloaded paper ever uh, on the SSRN database, which is pretty cool. Uh, take, take it for a spin. Trend following uh, usually uh, works by saving your hide during the long bear markets. If we ever have another one again, who knows? And you guys can see all the links and variations uh, here as well. Whew, that was a lot, y'all. Um, I'm going to wind down again. Uh, this has been a lot of fun episode of The Chart Book. If uh, you guys want to see more of these, let us know. Leave some comments, shoot us an email, share it with your friends, hit subscribe, and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys in the new year. Happy holidays, everyone. Be safe uh, and look forward to seeing everyone in the real world in 2022. Cheers.